Welcome back to the homestead. So we've been through the winter. It's 70 degrees outside. We want to talk about our Mr. Cool. So we're on about six months with this thing now. All heating. We had a fairly mild winter. I would say we didn't get to negative 30 like we sometimes do. But it was a pretty typical winter here in Maine. It was frozen all winter, snowed a lot. Uh, this space, which is basically 20 by 30, is not insulated the greatest. The walls have R13 in them. The ceiling has six inches of fiberglass, and that's it. And we kept the Mr. Cool set on 62 all winter, and it never had any problems. It kept this just beautiful, 62 degrees out here. If we wanted to come out and do a project, we could crank it up to 70 in about 15 minutes. We had a nice hot breeze out of the Mr. Cool. So we're really, really happy. Um, I'm actually going to go out on a limb and say that I like it better than I do my Fujitsu. Um, I feel like it works better. The controls for me are nicer. Like I can set the remote to follow me and I can put the remote over on the other side of the workshop and the whole workshop stays the right temperature. Whereas the Fujitsu, the temperature sensor is up in the top. So it actually gets some of its own heat and thinks it's happy and shuts down. The other thing I've noticed with the Fujitsu is it seems like sometimes it's blowing cool air in the winter. And I don't know if that's because the outside unit is shut off and the inside one hasn't ramped down yet or what. Um, I don't know. I, I, my, my honest opinion right now, if I was going to go out and spend my hard-earned money on them, which I did on both, I would buy another Mr. Cool before I buy another Fujitsu at this point. Uh, I would say that they're both pretty much a wash when it comes to efficiency. You can play games with those numbers all day long. But when it's 30 degrees outside, they both seem to be very efficient. They seem to be running about three to 500 watts of consumption to keep, you know, on average. And they cycle off and on. That's not continuous. I do have some kilowatt hour data on both, but it's just kind of boring data. They both seem to use the same amount of power. But it's not really apples to apples because the house is a lot bigger. This space is smaller. This space has got a smaller mini split. So, you know, you can't really look at it that way, but I can just tell by watching them run what it takes to do the job. So we're really happy. The cell phone app works really well. Um, everything about it so far has been just flawless. We're getting ready to go into our cooling season now. As summer kicks in, we will be running it in air conditioning mode in here to stay cool. And what we're probably going to do is sometime this summer, you're going to see us put another one in the woodworking shop. So the auto shop. Uh, sorry, yes, the auto shop. This is the woodworking shop. So that's kind of our, our six-month mark on a, a complete heating season with our Mr. Cool. We're really happy with it. We had no issues with it. It sends me a reminder to tell me when to change the fil or clean the filters. The Fujitsu, I have to try to remember, and I am terrible about doing things on a schedule. Um, if something's nagging me on my cell phone, change, clean the filter, clean the filter, I'll go do it. I can have it on my calendar, and I forget to go do it. So that's that's a nice feature. Um, all in all, we're really happy. We did have a couple questions on the electrical, and on our installation video, we didn't actually go over the electrical because we've done some other videos on electrical. But I was going to just give you a quick run through of the AC in the breaker panel and then the disconnect on the outside of the house. So let's walk over here without getting too dizzy. And we've got here our 100 amp sub panel. And what we've done is we've brought in a piece of 12 2 Romex because we needed a 20 amp circuit for the, the uh, Mr. Cool. And the Mr. Cool is 240 volts only. It does not need a neutral. So that's why you use 12 too. And you'll notice the white wire has red tape on it every so often, just to let us know that it's a current carrying conductor. You could use 12 three and cut off the neutral, but it's kind of wasteful and wire is like retardedly expensive right now. And we landed into a two pole, 20 amp, 240 volt breaker. So the black into one pole, the white taped red into the other pole, and then our ground goes right over here into our ground bus bar, right behind that, right down in here. And that's pretty much all there is in your, in your electrical panel. Um, it really is that simple. You buy, you find out what you have for a breaker panel. In our case, it's a square D home line breaker panel. And then you go into your electrical supply house or your big box store and you say, I have a 100 amp square D home line breaker panel and I need a two pole 20 amp breaker for that panel. Now be a little careful because in your electrical supply house, you'll be fine.
But if you walk into your big box store like Home Depot and say I need a two pole breaker, they do make a single breaker, single width breaker that has two handles. And that's what we call a space saver breaker. They will both be 120 only on the same phase. You'll notice this breaker is double wide and it gets both prongs. So it gets leg one and leg two of the split phase. So we've talked about this before, but incoming from your utility power, you have a, a leg one and a leg two, which is split phase. So this will be 120 volts to neutral or ground, and this will be 120 volts to neutral or ground. But between those, they're 180 degrees out of phase, you'll actually have 240 volts AC between those. So you need a two pole breaker, it needs to take up two spaces and go across two of those tabs. So make sure the breaker matches your breaker box. Bring your 12-2 in, label your white wire as a current carrying conductor using red tape or black tape, something, even a, if you have to, a black Sharpie if you really need to. But make sure it's not completely white, just so if somebody comes in behind you, they realize it's a current carrying conductor. Land your ground on your ground bus bar. Now this is important. If you're in a sub panel like I am here, we have a neutral bus bar on each side, and then we have a ground bus bar. Those two are isolated from each other. And because this is a ground, not a neutral, we want to go to the ground bus bar, not the neutral. And that's it for inside. It's really that simple. Leave your breaker off. We'll go out and we'll show you how to do the disconnect on the side of the house. We've already showed you how to do the mini split itself, but now we're going to go show you how to do the disconnect and go from there. All right, so now we're at our disconnect. We prefer the one with the brake handle on the outside of it. You can get a, an air conditioner pole disconnect. They're really cheap. This one's probably $50-ish at the electrical supply house. So what you need is you need a two-pole unfused disconnect. It doesn't need to be fused. You already have your fusing inside. This one happens to be three poles just because that's all they had at the electrical supply house. We're just not using the third pole. And here, if you're seeing this okay, we haven't been back and put our ground bus bar in, so pay no attention to that. But our wires from the house come out this conduit. We taped it black, and the other one is black, and we landed on those two prongs right there. And on the top, we come out of that with the two wires, and down through this flexible conduit to our mini split. You'll notice we taped that one black as well. And then you'll notice the handle, if I pull it, you'll see the, the, the prongs come out and it breaks the circuit. So these, these metal tabs right up here are what disconnect it and connect it. When I shove this in, you're going to see them snap back in the hole. And now the circuit's made. The one thing we haven't done, and you guys are great at reminding me here, because I'd forgotten all about this, this box has no ground lug in it. So we need to get a ground lug, and we need to actually ground the box, because right now the box isn't grounded, which is a no-no. But the system is grounded. The box itself is not grounded. But that's kind of it. You know, these disconnects come in, in different brands, different flavors. Um, whatever you get, it's going to look quite similar to that inside. And then what I like to use is what's called non-metallic liquid tight conduit. So it's a uh, plastic plastic conduit that's flexible. It's got special fittings. And that just runs over and right up into our mini split right up here. And you saw us do all this wiring. And then this control wire here comes all made up for the Mr. Cool. And it lands on three terminals in here. And it runs inside to the indoor head and plugs into three terminals in there. And just to keep things a little bit neat, I actually just cut a little hole in my trough right here. And I brought it out here and run it up along my conduit. And then of course our drain is hanging out the bottom down here. You want to make sure your drain doesn't ever go uphill anywhere. Um, that's a big one. Uh, but that's kind of it. So, yeah, that's our review, our six-month review. We really like it. Um, it's worked really well. Some of the things we've noticed, comparing it to the Fujitsu, the Fujitsu has what's called a low noise mode, and that does take care of the problem. But when it's not in its low noise, low noise mode, when the outdoor unit comes on, it sounds just like a car door closing outside. It's like, bang, and then it ramps up. This one doesn't do that. Um, again, it's pretty trivial things that we're talking about. They both work. So we're really happy, really happy with the Mr. Cool. We plan on putting another one right here and feeding it into the auto shop. So we'll bring you along for that when we do it. So we hope that that helped you with the questions on the AC and we hope that our review 
you know, inspires you to look into the Mr. Cool as well. Um, they have a do-it-yourself line where the connections are a quick coupling, like a hydraulic line, instead of a flared fitting. We bought all the tools to do the vacuuming ourselves because we, we were able to purchase just about everything we needed for about $300. And knowing we're going to do more than one, this unit was about $750. The mount was about $40. And the the stuff here was, I think, about $65. The do-it-yourself version of this that had the quick couplings was about $1,500. So for about half the money, you can get the Advantage series that has the flared connections. And you don't have to do any of the flaring yourself. The line set comes with it, and it's already pre-flared. So you just coil up the excess, hook it up here, and uh, you're good to go. Just like you'd have to coil up the excess with the DIY unit. You do lose your warranty. Um, the DIY unit is warrantied for do-it-yourselfers to install. The Advantage Series has to be installed by a licensed, you know, heating and cooling person of some form. So you have to be somehow certified. There is a lot of uh, classes you can take to become certified in, in refrigeration. I think it's level one, if I remember right. Uh, the, I think like 50 bucks you can get your license to do refrigeration on small stuff like this. And I actually thought about doing that. I just never got around to doing it. I chose to go this route because my thought was I'm saving half the money. And if it does fail, I can buy another one and still be in the same money that I was for the DIY unit. So it was a risk I was willing to take. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe.